and i was like are you kidding me that's like two points away from passing and i can't pass so like they're like no you're not ready you have to work on this work on that and i'm used to being like like a high achiever like you know as a general manager at a young age i was an all state all county soccer athlete well, i'm used to being like the best of the best and this was like a massive shot to my pride my ego because i was out here putting myself out there and then i failed pretty much i didn't pass the class so i had to choose do i take my ball and go home or do i swallow my pride and come back again for round two because there's many djs who don't pass the class and some of them just say forget it I'm, I'm i'm done with this some others come back take the class again and still don't pass because there's no guarantee that you're gonna pass it the second time it's all subjective you could mess up while you dj this next time you could not get sound up you could just not perform well so it's very subjective you have to really be on your stuff a second time there's no guarantee what made it worse this time is that after our final exam we had like this reception where alumni was there and people who were in the certification program were there and so it was like a mini celebration for the people who passed but if you didn't pass you were still there people knew you took the final exam they knew you didn't pass it was extremely embarrassing it was just bad and i think at the same time that this happened like i think there was this girl i was talking to and she was like i don't want to talk to you anymore we should just be friends i don't want to be friends so you have a, a whammy with your personal life then with the dj life you don't pass the class either so i was kind of down in the down in the dumps it was it was quite humbling um so i decided to not take my ball home i decided to stay take the class again and i go through the whole class and this time I get one of the highest scores ever in the program, so I was extremely proud. Welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. In this podcast, you will experience wisdom, advice, and stories from creatives all over the world. Your host is Amani Roberts, who is a DJ, music producer, professor, avid book reader, and developing salsa dancer. On the show, we love to share the stories of creative professionals, especially people who've gone from the corporate life to the creative life. Once again, welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 50 of the Amani Experience Podcast. For this podcast, we have a very special episode because this is the podcast where I will interview myself. So I want to explain to you the process and what we did to create this episode. I sent a note out to all of my previous guests, the first 49 guests, and asked them if they were to ask me a question. If they wanted to interview me, what would they ask? In addition, I had a lot of people who listened and they were like, well, when are you going to interview yourself, Amani? We want to hear about you. So this is the episode for that to happen. I hope you enjoy it. Um, it took me a lot of time and effort and work to make this happen, but it's exciting and I think it will be fun for me. Now, when I get the questions, I organize them, but I don't really take a look at them and prepare a like a prearranged answer. I just got the questions, organize them in terms of the audio, and then only when I first hear them on the show will I really be able to sit down and think about them a lot and answer them. So it's as much on the fly as I could make it. I think you'll like it. And here we go with our first question. How would you summarize yourself in 30 seconds or less? All right, let's see if I can get this done in 30 seconds. I would say I am a DJ, an avid book reader, a Washington, D.C. area native who loves his local sports teams, um, someone who's worked in hotels for almost 20 years and retired to really follow his passion, and just someone who loves to teach and give back to the community, you know, also a very skilled chef, have to put that in there as well, love to cook, and just someone who really is trying to make it day by day, enjoy myself, have fun, and there, there we go, that's what I would say. And I can't forget an up and coming music producer, I love to do remixes, and that really fills me up, so I gotta add that in there too, cool. This is Russell Harris. I have a question for Armani Roberts. What was the experience or the event that pushed you towards the event industry? Thanks to Russell for that question. Uh, Russell was in episode 27 of the podcast. And funny story about it is that when I was able to track Russell down to get him to record that question, we were at the middle of the MPI Southern California Installation Gala Awards Banquet at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. So that's why I was a little noisy. But to answer Russell's question, when I was young, my family, my brother, my mom, and 
father and I, we used to take road trips and we would take road trips across the country. We would drive almost every summer to St. Louis from the DC area, which was a good 20, 22 hours. So we had to stop overnight. And when we stopped overnight, we would stop at hotels. And so that's when I got my first experience like traveling and kind of in the hospitality industry. And I was I was caught up. I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. So initially, I had wanted to go to school to be a chef because I had some cooking skills. So I thought, okay, I can be a chef. But um, I quickly realized that I was a little too selfish to be cooking meals for 200, 250 people. Maybe I could cook a meal for three or four people and that was it. So no chef, but I still enjoyed hospitality and hotels. So I went to Howard University. I majored in hospitality management. My concentration was finance. So I went through the program there. I got my first job in hotels. I think I was 17 years old. I was very young. I'm still very young. And I was, back in the day, they used to have a cashier that would sell you your tickets to get your drinks. Nowadays, they just have the bartender do both. But I was that cashier, so I did that. And then I was able to go and work at for Marriott, I started working for Marriott after that at the front desk of the Washington Westin Marriott. That's where I met one of my close friends, David Snow, who's down in Texas. And from there, it was ironic because this was right at the end of the savings and loan crisis. So real estate was really tenuous. It was like late 92, early 93. So no hotels were hiring. And But somehow I was fortunate because I used to coach kids playing soccer. So one of the people and parents that I coached was a big time executive for Marriott. So he hooked me up with a summer job, and I was off and running from Marriott. I worked at that hotel for like two years. I was a front desk supervisor. Then I worked in corporate headquarters at Marriott International Headquarters in Bethesda for a year. Then I moved to Atlanta, worked during the 96 Atlanta Olympics, which was hectic and crazy, but lots of learning. Then I moved to Chicago, Illinois, was like an operations manager at a courtyard by Marriott out in Wooddale. From there, I was 23 years old, and I was honored and fortunate enough to be selected to be opening general manager of a hotel in Dallas, Texas. So I moved down to Dallas, Texas and opened up a hotel down there, 136 suite hotel. It was there where I fell in love with sales. So from that, after we successfully opened that hotel, then I moved to Miami, Florida at the Biscayne Bay Marriott, which was amazing, just amazing hotel, amazing sales team and an awesome city. I love Miami. So I was there for like two years and then I got a little homesick. So I wanted to move back to DC. So I moved back to DC. It was like a Director of National Accounts for the Crystal Gateway Marriott in like Arlington, Virginia. We were like four blocks from the Pentagon when 9 11 happened. I had just moved to DC when 9 11 happened. So I was moved to DC like August 20th and then September 11th that happened. So I was in the hotel. We had to evacuate the hotel. It was very scary. One of the scariest experiences of my life, actually, because we were wondering where that fourth plane was and we had to take care of the guests as well. At nighttime, you'd hear sirens the entire night. We could smell smoke from the Pentagon in the hotel. It was crazy. It was crazy. So from there, I was at that hotel for like two years. Then I moved and was director of marketing at the Bethesda Marriott out in Bethesda, Maryland. So I was there for, I think, probably like four, four and a half years. And then I got the urge and I moved to the West Coast. So then I moved out to L.A., I was a director of marketing at the Renaissance Montour Hotel LAX. I was there for a couple of years, then went to Marina Del Rey Marriott as a director of marketing. So did that for two years. And then we went through a sales transformation. So I was kind of like a regional director of sales and marketing. And I did that for a year and a half. And then I decided to retire and pursue my DJ goal in business full time, which we'll get into the episode. But that's kind of how I got my start in hospitality hotels in the events industry and that'll take you up to the time period where i started my company thanks for the question russell hi it's jamie congratulations on the 50th episode i'm so happy to participate in this how did you get into djing and how did you make a living from it thanks for the question jamie jamie was from episode 15 make sure you check out her episode it was really good it's actually one of my highest downloaded episodes ever so Props to you, Jamie. Thanks for being so open on our episode. To answer your question, I'm going to trace it back to when I was like in high school, junior high school, high school. I used to collect a lot of records at first and then CDs. I used to always buy CDs. I would work at a grocery store, Snyder supermarket. I'd take all my tip money and buy CDs. And that's what I trace it back to. And growing up, 
you know, I used to love, there are two shows in DC. One was um, The Quiet Storm with Melvin Lindsay. And another one was, I think it was After Dark with Glenn Hollis on Wash FM. So I used to love those two shows because it'd be like the DJ playing the slow jams and doing all the dedications. That's like one of my dream jobs ever still. I love to do that. I think out here, the equivalent would be Art LeBeau. And he would have people call in and make dedications and things like that. So that's when I first kind of got the idea of being like a radio DJ. And then in 1995, I went to go see Bismarck E at Quigley's Nightclub in downtown D.C. And Bismarck E set the crowd off. It was amazing. And it was at that moment that I was like, I want to do what he did. He had this set within his set where he played all TV theme show songs. Like it could be the Jeffersons, What's Happening, Fat Albert, Golden Girls, Facts of Life. We were all singing along. It was amazing. And so that's when I really, it hit home. I said, that's what I want to do. I took the traditional route and worked in corporate America because I didn't feel that being a DJ was a legitimate career. I was wrong. And so I worked my way around the U.S. And when I got to L.A., something about being in California and Los Angeles, just like kind of entrepreneurship and going for your dreams and pursuing things that are a little bit different is just encouraged. It's part of the fiber of the city. So I decided to go for it. So I started DJing at this one bar, West 4th Jane in um, Santa Monica. And then I also would DJ at uh, Chelsea's bar and grill shout out to dj tetris who helped me out there and would show me things and then one of my closest friends in life josh he went to scratch academy for one class and he came back to me told me he said you know i think you know you would benefit from going to scratch academy says, i know you're djing now but it could help you with your fundamentals so of course i trust josh so i was like okay so i went to one um i signed up for one semester there and I was hooked after the first class. I went through the entire program at Scratch. And so I did that as like a year-long program. And then right after that, um, graduated and just started DJing more and more events. And, you know, went back to Scratch for music production school. And that's how I really got into music production. So that's my quick little story about how I got into DJing. And how do I make a living from it is I do all sorts of events. I do corporate events, whether it be for corporations like Mattel or Northrop Grumman or any corporation. They have a corporate event. I'll do that. I do social events. So I do weddings. I just had two weddings I did in the month of June. So I'll do weddings. I'll teach people how to DJ as well. So I do that. That's fun. I have a new team building activity called Wheels of Steel by the Amani Experience. And what that is, is that instead of your traditional team building activity where you might do a ropes course or get in the circle and share things, we have like an immersive DJ lesson that we do with everyone involved. It can be three people. It can be 100 people. And that's something that, you know, is newer, but we're really trying to promote. And it's exciting. It's fun. So between those kind of three or four revenue streams, you know, also DJ at clubs and bars, that's how I can kind of make a living. You know, it's not easy. It's really a grind. But as you continue to get better and more experienced, you get the higher quality gigs, which, you know, then you can work less gigs, but get more money. And so that's how I've been able to make a living so far. It's, it's a daily grind, but I love it. And yeah, there you go. Thanks again, Jamie. Hi, Imani. Uh, these are my questions for you for your 50th uh, podcast episode for the Imani experience. So I'm curious if you would ever consider going back to corporate America or if you could see a way that your platform would fit into corporate America, maybe as a pivot or if it's something that you um, have thought about incorporating into the corporate world. So that lovely voice was Claire from episode 17. Thanks for the question, Claire. So to answer this question, um, I definitely do not want to go back to corporate America. You know, never say never, but I'm definitely trying to set it up and set up kind of revenue streams so that I don't have to go. There are different things that I can depend on. If maybe the business, DJ business gets slow, I have other activities that I can do that can generate revenue. I really think that making this leap has been one of the best decisions of my life. It hasn't been easier. It's probably been significantly more difficult, but it's been much better. So I definitely don't think I'll go back, don't want to, never say never. In terms of incorporating what I do into corporate kind of work and atmosphere, some of the things that I do, like the team building activity could be ways that I could partner with people in corporate America. I've also been approached by a few people from corporations to produce podcasts for their companies. So I think that's definitely a way where this platform, the podcast platform can be applied in corporate America. I can partner, we can produce I, you know, go on, go on site and record the interviews or whatever they want to say and produce them, create everything. So I think that's definitely one way in the future where would lead me to 
partner with corporate America. But in terms of going back to work again, I really, really don't want to, don't think so. Never say never, but we'll see. Thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Anna Braff with Provenance Rentals. We love Amani, and so we're so excited to ask some questions of him now that he's in the hot seat. (laughs) Do you ever miss things about working the corporate nine to five? Oh, we love you too, Anna. Thanks for the question. Anna Braff from episode 41. Great question. I think what I do miss about working the 9 to 5 in corporate America would be the people. I met some amazing people. I worked in corporate America, Marriott, and and hospitality for over 20 years. Met some of my closest friends in life. Had some amazing experiences in a bunch of different cities. And so it's really the people that I meet. I still keep in touch with a bunch of people that I work with throughout all the different hotels. So I miss the people. I miss the incredible discount we would able we were able to get with benefits because benefits are expensive when you're on your own so benefits for sure i missed that and then just like the reliability of every two weeks you're going to get a certain amount of revenue deposited to your account conversely you know the dj life i could have some weeks some months where i get significantly more but then there could be some other months where i get significantly less so It's a little more stressful and it's a little more unpredictable in terms of the revenue now, but the chances for making so much more revenue is greater that it's well worth the trade-off. But that's what I miss, the people, you know, the benefit prices or rates or whatever. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Great question though, thank you. Hey Imani, it's Ashley with Anaheim Studios. I hope you're well. I've got two questions for your 50th episode of your podcast, which is really awesome, by the way. Uh, My first question, is there anything that you learned when you worked in the corporate world that you feel has helped you as a DJ and that applies uh, in the creative field? Thanks for the question, Ashley, who was in episode 21 with us on the show. I learned a ton of things working in corporate America. I think, you know, I'll give you a top five list. The first thing would be like forecasting. Every month, I'll forecast my revenue that I'm anticipating getting for that month, and then I'll track to see how that compares to last year. I'll also track to see how much I pick up in the month for the month. So say if I forecast like I'm going to get $10,000 in the month of July, I end up getting $13,000, then that means I've picked up $3,000 in the month for the month, which is good to see trends. Conversely, if I say I'm forecasting $10,000 and I only get 8,000, that's another trend as well. So forecasting for sure, just the whole accounting, profit and loss statements, all that budgeting, like that's definitely, I learned all that, you know, in hotels and I apply everything I've learned in terms of that subject to my company as well. One of the biggest things that I use every day is just the importance of networking. I was able to get as far as I did in corporate America just from networking, because as they say, It's not what you know, but it's who you know. And I definitely think that's true as an entrepreneur as well. So just networking, keeping in touch with people, being genuine, being authentic, following up with them. I just think that's so important. And I learned that in corporate America, like, you know, went to classes, was able to do trial and error, just keeping in touch with people. They wouldn't follow up. They would follow up. So that has helped my business out immensely, just networking, because many of the referrals and the business that I get, it's all... It's all word of mouth. It's all networking. We just got a remix client and it was just from networking at ASCAP in May. We talked to the the gentleman, got to know him there, kept in touch. He hired us to do a remix for him. It's just, it's just every day I see more and more examples. Also branding, you know, Mary, I did a tremendous job in terms of branding their different brands and hotels. So I was able to learn there and apply it to my business here, you know, because branding, because it's all about branding and how you brand yourself as an individual and as a company. So I learned that. And then one lesson that I learned in corporate America is just, you know, sometimes companies, big companies don't recognize trends early enough. So they're late to the game. So that taught me to keep an eye out to what's popular, what's losing momentum and be able to make pivots and shifts as we see it. Whereas, you know, I had some experiences in in corporate America where it took us too long to make pivots. So it hurt us in the long run. So that's something else that I learned as well. But amazing question, Ashley. Thank you very much. What was the point in time when you decided to leave the corporate life and pursue your own dream business career? I remember working at the hotel and going into a meeting and finding out that my job was eliminated. And that was just like shocking to me. I was like, what? So job was eliminated. I was able to 
apply for a new job and get rehired. But that was a wake up call for me. So then I'm sitting in a hotel again, you know, three years. And I was like, I got to leave. I got to do something else. This is not for me. I have to figure out something because this just isn't working. But I was really scared because I was comfortable, used to the paycheck, the nice bonuses twice a year, you know, just filling up, you know, your savings account, all your stocks and everything. And then the job was eliminated a second time. So I don't know what they say. It's like, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. But the second time was limited. I was like, oh boy, like this, you know, this is not good. But I was still scared. And then I got rehired again. I was very fortunate. And this last job, you know, I like to be with people. I like to work with people, help them grow, help let people help me grow. But this last job was about spreadsheets and meetings and presentations. And then I had a boss that wasn't really focused on working with her team. She was more worried about her next promotion. I was like, no, this is not going to work. So that was the point where I was like, you know what? It's now or never. I have to I have to go because I just wasn't in a good mental space. I just wasn't growing. I wasn't happy. It was just stressing me out. So I just said, you know what? Let me just get to a year, retire, get my vacation time and just figure it out. Like I probably left sooner than you know the perfect scenario would have been but i had to go because mentally it was not a good i was not in a good place it was time to go so that's when i just said i gotta go it took me three years to gain the courage to have enough courage to leave but i left what is important for creative professionals to succeed in today's business environment? I love asking all of my guests this question because just to hear their stories and perspective, it's unique, it's very informative. And so now I can answer myself. And what I would say is important for creative professionals to succeed in today's business environment is three main things. First, they have to be resilient. You have to be resilient, be able to respond and come back from adversity because it's going to happen to you, whether you're creative in year one or you're creative in year 15. So how you respond to resiliency and just continuing to you know, come back and you fall down seven times, you get up eight times. Another characteristic is just to be flexible. You know, I never would have thought when I first started DJing that I would also teach it. But what happened is that people kept coming up to me saying and asking, well, do you give lessons? I'd love to learn just with you. I don't want to go to a class. Can can maybe you teach me? And so I said, OK, sure, I can do that because, you know, if you teach it, then I, it'll help me learn it better. So just be flexible, be able to take small little pivots here and there. And then third is just just kindness. Just be nice. I think there's so many different vendors and people out there that are working that if you could be nice and easy to work with and just thoughtful and, and want to set your other vendors and other partners up for success as well as your client, I think that that'll go a long way. Now, sure, in the short term, maybe some other people that aren't as nice will get some benefits. But in the long run, people will continue to remember, oh, I really like working with the money. He was this. He was that. He really made it easy. We were able to kind of help out a client that was upset. So if you're kind, I think that goes a long way. I also have people ask me about, you know, well, how can I become more resilient? And I just think the best way is to listen to different interviews or podcasts on people that have been through trials and tribulations and hear their stories and what they did so you can learn from them. And reading autobiographies is really good. I remember I read the autobiography of the golfer Ben Hogan, who went through a lot of tough times, and that was very inspiring. I learned from him. And just recently, I finished reading the autobiography for Luther Vandross, and he went through some tough times as well. I know we think of him as like this platinum recording artist, but he had a tough time at the beginning, middle, and end of his career. So just to hear some stories, it's just inspiring. It, it gives you more confirmation and might give you a clue as to what you can do to become more resilient. Hi, Imani. It's Nanette from Chrome Cycle Studio. As you interview yourself for your 50th interview, I'd like to know, as a DJ, what made you create the Amani Experience podcast and go into interviewing other people and telling their stories? Now, you might not recognize that voice, but that's Nanette Wasif, and she's going to be episode 51, which will be one of the first episodes of season two. When I was talking to her, she asked me such a good question. I said, let's record the question, and I'll answer it on my 50th episode because I, many people ask me that, and I want to share the answer. So why did I start the podcast? A couple reasons, like, you know, as a DJ, I want to be known as more than just a DJ. I want to be known as like a thought leader in the space and kind of, you know, I'm active in different organizations. So I want to continue to grow my personal brand. So it's not just Amani the DJ, but Amani, you know, the cool person, the dope person. And so one 
way you can do it is you can like blog, you can be have a lot of videos, vlog or whatever. You can also do podcasts. And, you know, there's a couple of different ways. I thought, oh, I can do a podcast because I can show off and share my my original music. I can interview interesting people and just kind of pay it forward. So I had the idea about the podcast. I give credit to um, the business coach I had, Marla. Thank you for giving me the idea. And so I just took it and run ran with it. And so what I found is that every time I interview someone, it's like going to a master class in their specific specialty, whether it be a yoga instructor, a professional speaker, an actor, a singer, you know, whomever I interview, I get to learn from them one to one and then share it with everyone else. And it's just I love it. It's great. And the response has been bigger than I ever imagined. And so that's the reason why I started the podcast and why I continue to do the podcast because, you know, I'm masterclass, I'm learning, I'm sharing, and it continues to establish me as a thought leader in the creative space in addition to being a DJ. So that was my plan and my goal and so far so good, having a great time. Thanks for the question, Nanette, and I look forward to sharing your episode with people in the upcoming weeks. Why do you love what you do? Ooh, there are a couple reasons why I love what I do. Here they are. So if I'm at a club or a bar and I'm DJing and I'm playing a song, we're in a groove and the crowd is like, I'm getting good energy from the crowd and we're playing a popper song and I cut the volume and they sing along to the lyrics. That's why I love what I do because that's a great feeling when the crowd is with you and they're they're singing and they have no inhibitions and they you cut the volume and they sing the lyrics with you. That's an amazing feeling. So I love that. Another reason why I love what I do is if I'm teaching someone And one of the hardest concepts to get is beat matching. So when we go over that and it's really repetitive, you have to practice, bring it back, practice again. But when I see them get that concept and it's like a light bulb goes off in their head and they understand and then they can repeat it a couple of times and you see the relief and just the, the pure joy in terms of how they've understood the concept. We had to practice. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Then they got it. Then they get it again. That's another reason why I love what they do. To see that light bulb go off in people's students ages 10, ages 65, and they get it, that's another reason why I love what I do. It fills me up. And then finally is when we're doing remixes and to be able to produce a remix and then release it and then either have people that I don't know tag it, make a good comment, share it, that's amazing. And when I'm playing it at a bar, club, an event, and you can see people nodding their heads and and dancing to it, that's great. And the icing on the cake is that someone comes up to me and is like, I recognize the song, but I don't know this version. What's this version? And I could be like, hey, it's this remix I did. And I'll say, I can send it to you if you like. That's probably the third reason why I love what I do, just because of those feelings you get when you create something, either a moment or you teach someone something or you have a you know, a song that you remix that people like and unprompted, they come up to you. That's why I love what I do. Aloha, Amani. This is your friend, Colleen. First of all, congratulations on your 50th episode. I'm so excited to hear your podcast. My question for you would be, What is one piece of advice that you've been given by a mentor, a friend, a family member, something that has impacted the way that you have, that you do business or the path that you've chosen? I look forward to hearing your answer. Aloha, my friend. Thanks for the question, Colleen. Colleen was episode 23. I was fortunate enough to be in Hawaii on site doing her interview, which was an amazing time. So that was fun. I'm going to have to get back there real soon. For this question, I'm going to share two pieces of advice that I was given. The first was from a mentor who said, whenever you do a follow-up, make sure you write a handwritten note. I found that out really early. I think I was like a junior or senior in college, and they advised that. I've been practicing, practicing that for the rest of my career. It's been very beneficial. Even now, in the day and age of texting and emails, a handwritten note will go so far. Whenever I talk to the kids in college, students in college or high school, I always tell them to do a handwritten note because the fortune's in the follow-up. And I think that now it's more important than ever because I know for me, when I check my mail, all I have is junk mail and bills. But if I see a handwritten note, I'm going to open that up first and kind of keep keep that and throw away the rest of the stuff. So that was one piece of advice. And then early on in life, 
my dad would advise me to, you know, you're not allowed to give up, never give up. I know it's kind of cliche, but it can be applied to so many aspects of your life. And I know that because of this advice, it was ringing in my head when I was with Marriott for so long. That's probably one of the reasons why I stayed at Marriott so long is because I didn't want to feel like I was giving up when really it was something else and it was time to move. So I'm good with that. But just in terms of like sports and like classes, I'll tell a story later about Scratch. Like you're just not allowed to give up. And then ironically, my, you know, instructor, my music instructor, remix partner, V Fresh, Vine, who was episode 40, I think he was 47. Um, he says that all the time as well. He says, whatever we do, we're not allowed to give up because I work with him and I practice my piano. And so sometimes it takes me a long time to learn things. You know, I can't learn things as fast as I thought I should be able to, whether it be, you know, a three octave C sharp scale and triplets or, you know, my arpeggios. And so I struggle and, you know, it's embarrassing, but it's frustrating. And he said, you know, whatever you do, laugh about it, but you're never allowed to give up. You're not allowed to give up. And so I think... Be it may be it that it might be cliche, I think that's some of the best advice that I've gotten in the past that I still continue to use in the current and will use in the future as well. Thanks for the question, Colleen. These questions are from Liliana, episode eight. What is your motivating morning routine? What is your peaceful place where you go to chill? What is one of the best pieces of advice you have ever heard? Liliana was able to email me her question so i'm going to answer it now in terms of my morning motivational routine what i do is i get up in the morning i walk my dog nyla about 10 or 15 minutes i'll come back here and then i'll journal for like well i'm doing morning pages now so it takes me a little bit longer so i'll journal for like probably 10 15 minutes and then i practice my piano and something about practicing the piano early in the morning kind of clears my head gets me pumped up and so it just really really is very um What's the proper term for it? Like, it's very meditational for me. So I just kind of go through my routine, my exercises, 35, 40 minutes then, and that kind of gets me going. While I'm writing the morning pages, I will listen to some kind of, I have like a playlist on YouTube that's like motivational speeches. I'll leave it in the show notes. So I'll listen to that while I'm writing. I practice my piano, and then finally I'll check my phone and get to my um, work of the day. But that's kind of what I do in the morning to get up and go and clear my head, download my thoughts for the night before, and then attack the day. So Liliana's next question was, what is my piece of place to go to where I love to go chill? You know, I don't really have a place like that yet. I'm kind of looking. Hopefully, I can renovate my back patio and that can become the area. But I will go to like restaurants and I can sit off in a quarter by myself and just chill and kind of I like to do that, specifically like breakfast restaurants and get some breakfast. So that's something I do there. Um, but I'm working on that. That's a work in progress. So I'll get back to you on that one, Liliana. And then her final question is, what are some of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard? So I'm going to share bits and pieces of advice throughout this whole podcast, but there's one that stood out to me that I heard pretty recently. I actually read it in Tim Ferriss's book, Tribe of Mentors, and it's from the children's author. I believe you pronounce his name like Soman Chanani. He writes The School of Good and Evil, that whole series, and he says, too often aspiring artists put pressure on themselves to make their creative work their only source of income. In my experience, It's a road to misery. If art is your sole source of income, then there's unrelenting pressure on that art. And mercenary pressure pressure is the enemy of the creative elves inside you trying to get the work done. Having another stream of income drains the pressure on your creative engine. If nothing comes of your art, you still have an ironclad plan to support yourself. As a result, your creative soul feels lighter and free to do its best work. I think that's tremendous advice because I know that if I just had to depend on DJing while I'm still growing the business, um, I would have to take any and every gig to pay my bills and I would get burned out really quickly. I could see it happen before and I could see how it happened with me. So I think this advice, I just read it a little over a year ago, barely a year ago, is tremendous. So I want to share it with everyone and then I'll share other advice as the podcast goes on. Thanks for sending in your question, Leah, and we will see you soon. It's Jen. Is it better to be extraordinary late or good on time? What's love got to do with it anyways? What do you wish every client knew about you before your first meeting? What do you wish clients knew before meeting with any DJ in the industry? 
<laughs> Jen sends me four very good questions. Jen So from episode 18. Let's get to your first question. I think it's better to be good on time. I feel that if you are not on time, if you are late, that just that's very bad. It's very and many times disrespectful. I personally feel that if you can be there on time, we can teach you how to go from being good to being extraordinary. So that's a good question. That's my opinion. That's what I think. In terms of what I wish clients knew about me before my first meeting with them, just first, how much they care about the event they're having, or how much I care, actually, because I know they care. So how much I care about the event they're having. Each event that I do, I really want it to be successful. It's really important to me and the client. I want the client to be happy, and I just put an extreme amount of care and kindness into every event that I do. So that's one thing. Second would be how my experience in the industry has taught me numerous lessons which will benefit the client. There's so many things that I've learned being on the other side, whether it be managing a venue, events, sales. So just how my experience will benefit them. And then third, just how thankful I am that they're even considering a DJ. I know that many clients have lots of opportunities and options in terms of what to pick, whether it be a DJ, a band, you know, any type of entertainment. So I'm just grateful that they're thinking about a DJ. So that's the third thing I would hope that they would know. And then in terms of what do I wish each client knew before me with any DJ in the industry, you know, just that DJs can make or break your party. I mean, music can change the entire mood, tenor of your party, and no, iPads will not work. So just if you're going to hire a professional, hire a DJ, it will make your party just amazing. Don't, don't skip on the entertainment. Also, the DJs, we're professionals, so we should be paid as such as well. Don't leave us the least amount of money to spend. If you spend the mo money on a DJ and you spend more money on a DJ, it will be worth it in the long run. And then finally, the best DJs out there, a lot of my colleagues know that it's about the client, what the client wants and not about what the DJ wants to play. So collaboration is key. We're always putting our clients' needs and desires first. So just that's what I hope that clients would know as well. And then for your final question, I think love has everything to do with it. That's my opinion. Thanks, Jen. What was the turning point in your career? I definitely think that in terms of the turning point of my career, I want to say graduating from scratch back in 2013, June 2013. What happened is that the experience I went through there was a massive growth experience for me, both personally and professionally. I'll kind of get into the whole story a little later. But just graduating from that, the, what I learned and just how it legitimized my DJ skills it was just massive. And you'll see that my business just kind of took off after that point. It gave me so much confidence. It taught me so much about business, about troubleshooting, fixing issues that are happening with the sound. It helped me develop a network of people that I'm still tapped into to a high degree. And it was just that time period that I was there for about a year just really opened up my world to DJing meeting new mentors, just seeing different people, younger, older than me, succeeding. It was very inspiring. It was very challenging as well. But that one experience was one of the turning points. There are other things that happened kind of after that that were very impactful, but that whole experience there was just, it was amazing. I met some very close friends who I'm still close friends with now. You know, my remix partner, I met him there as well. And I just you know, that just opened up a whole new world. I had no idea when I went there what would happen. I just thought, oh, I'll go, I'll learn some things, I'll come home. But it completely changed everything with my career, my business, and even personally as well, too. So that definitely is the turning point of my career. The DJ music producer industry is a crowded space. How do you rise above all the noise and distinguish yourself? There definitely is a lot of DJs out there in the world, specifically on the West Coast in Los Angeles, so there's no shortage of supply. What I try to express to people and how I differentiate myself is a few reasons. First, I'm like a professionally trained DJ. I went to school two times, first for music production, or first for DJing and second for music production. So I've been trained on all the aspects of DJing. So I think that um, that's a very big differentiator. Also, I've got over 10 years of experience DJing. So I've seen a multitude of events, different issues I've had to take care of. Many times we have a lot of DJs out there that just kind of buy a controller and some songs and think they can DJ. So I've got over 10 years of experience 
In addition, I've worked in hospitality for over 25 years, so I really get the customer service part. I understand what it takes to put on an event behind the scenes, and so that really helps me out a lot as well. And then finally, I'm active within industry associations. For example, I'm really active with Meeting Planners International, MPI, the Southern California chapter, as well as starting to get more active on the global way as well. And I think that the combination of all of the facts I just mentioned helped me, helps me continue to differentiate myself and rise above the competition, the noise, trying to become more than just a DJ, like a thought leader in the DJ space and in the creative space. I think all these facts and features combined help me to distinguish myself and differentiate myself and also allows me to kind of stay ahead of the trends and see what's coming and just be the ultimate resource for my clients. Amani Roberts, congratulations on your 50th episode. This is Dr. Walter Sands, America's number one person development expert. And I have a question for you. How do you stay motivated? Hey, Amani. Happy 50th episode and huge congratulations. Uh, my question to you is what motivates you? What are you excited to do every morning that helps you get out of bed and get back to work every single day? All right. Looking forward to hearing your answer. Bye. All right. That voice you heard was Gabby from episode two. And before her was Walter Sims, Dr. Walter Sims from episode four. So in terms of motivation, staying motivated, one thing that I've seen the last three years that's really helped me to stay motivated is that my piano practice. So about a little over three years ago, I had to learn piano because I wanted to improve my music theory. So I had a really close friend of mine, Terasana. She was like, look, your, your original tracks aren't good. You need to learn music theory. So I had to swallow my pride, learn music theory. And how I learn music theory is I take piano classes every Wednesday, nonstop, all year round. And even though I grew up a saxophone player, when I started to learn piano, I was not very good. I couldn't even do like little C major scale one octave. So, you know, I had to practice. And when I would practice, I would see myself improve every week. Like I'd get better. I'd maybe do it quicker. We have a metronome. I was able to speed up the metronome, do it quicker. Then we got into two octaves. Then we got into arpeggios. Then we got into original music. And when I would see myself improve little by little, that really helped to keep me motivated, stay motivated because I was like, oh, I'm putting in the work and I'm actually getting better. And it just was really, really inspiring to myself. It seems like a small thing, but it was very motivating. The similar thing is like scratching. So DJs scratch all the time and you have to learn these complex scratches. So you have like a baby scratch, a chirp scratch. And so I was, you know, my scratching skills were, weren't the strongest either. So every day I would practice scratching after piano. And at first I would try like this one click flares, two click flares, these transformers, all these different scratches. And I wasn't good at first, but sure enough, as I keep practicing the scratches, I get better and better. And so that continued to motivate me as well. In terms of the business, when I would be able to do high profile events, that that really was inspiring and motivating me to do more because those are very fun. Like I did Zach Ertz and Julia Johnson's wedding at Bacara. I worked that with Alistair, who was episode 49. And that was really inspiring and motivating because I was like, I want to do more of these events. It's lots of fun. It's cool. So that um, that helps because, you know, eventually I want to be able to DJ like the Grammys, the Oscars, the Emmys, the ESPYs. I want to DJ all these major events because it will be fun and it'll be kind of cool to add to my little DJ resume. So when I do one high profile event, it really helps me to get motivated and stay motivated because I want to do more. And then when Gabby asked, you know, what allows me to get out of bed and really kind of keeps me ready for the day? A combination of all the things I previously mentioned. And then finally, it's just remixes. Like, I love to do remixes. And so, you know, I'll get out of bed and I'll be thinking about what's the next remix we're going to work on. I'll listen to different songs and listen to the drum patterns and the rhythm and the harmonies and think about ideas and write ideas. And so just the fact of doing remixes and being creative and figuring out how I can you know, change and bring a song that maybe has been dormant for a while back to life that really, really motivates me and keeps me going. So I think those would be some ways and things that really help me to stay motivated and keeps me going day after day. Great questions, you two. Thank you. 
Hey, Amani, it's Cindy Rude, a.k.a. Episode 44 from Formidable Joy. Congratulations on 50 episodes. That's quite the milestone. Um, I'm just so, so grateful to you for taking the time to get to know all of us and hearing our stories. And you're so generous with your time and talent and talking to all of us about our passions, but now we want to know things about you. So here's just a couple questions that I have for you. One is, what truly brings you joy, Amani? What really sets your soul on fire? Thanks for the question, Cindy. This is a good one. I think I'm going to answer your question just in terms of the podcast and how it kind of sets my soul on fire and really kind of gets me going. I get people who send me emails or text messages tell me about how specific episodes have helped them make a change in their life or helps their clients change things. Like I have a friend, Amanda, she shared the podcast with one of her friends and clients that's in Canada and it really helped out this young lady. So that really gets me going. I had another friend who was thinking about starting a business and they just were unsure and they heard a couple of the episodes that um, I had in the past and they were like, ooh, that really pushed them to at least make a start or whatever. I remember I had a friend that texted me right after Chris Pardall's episode when Chris was talking about how he had almost OD'd and he was at the hospital and he had just tons of issues. And I had someone text me say that they shared that episode with another friend who was going through a similar kind of chemical dependency issue and that really allowed them to open up the conversation. And so I think that, you know, even another friend who was maybe had some family issues and was was on kind of the outs or not speaking to a family member, just to hear that this podcast, the interview that they did, maybe open up some lines of communication or just allow that person to hear how they felt and, and their feelings. That's the kind of stuff that really moves me because my goal, even I had a friend that I'm on the MPI Southern California board with Megan. She heard the episode we had with um, Liz, who has the mobile dog grooming service. And she thought that episode was wonderful. She shared it with one of her friends and it had impact. That's the goal. The goal is for each episode can just touch one person to help them either make a change in their life, you know, maybe take the leap and go from, you know, the corporate life to the creative life or just open up the discussion. That's the goal. And then when I hear stories about how that happens, that really sets me on fire, so to speak, as Cindy said, that really fills me up. It makes me happy because the goal of the podcast is just to share people's stories, share people who you might not know, but hear their stories, why they decided to do what they did, what kind of um, barriers that they have to overcome, how they maybe fell down but got back up. And so to do the podcast with that goal in mind and then get feedback that it's actually happening and people are sharing their stories about how it's helping, that really, really sets my soul on fire and I love it. And so that's the way I will answer your question, Cindy, but it's a great question and that's what's happening. So if you're out there and you're listening and either you've experienced some sort of growth or been able to share with a friend, the podcast, any episode and had some positive impact, please share the stories with me because I love it and I'll talk about it. And yeah, thank you. Hi friend, it's Carly, the flower chef. And my question for you is what is the trait you most admire in people? And what is the trait you most deplore? I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. Keep on inspiring and doing great work. What's up, Carlita? Thanks for the question, Carly. She was episode seven of the podcast. I think that's a Vanity Fair question. The trait that I admire the most in people is people who are resilient. I think that when I see people who have fallen, but they keep getting back up and they keep pushing forward and then they are achieving success, I think that's very inspiring. And I just I really look up to people like that. I think that, you know, the most beautiful people in the world have scars. And when you fall down, that creates scars and you're able to come back and keep going. I just find that incredibly inspiring. And it just really tells a lot about people's character. They don't give up. They're able to get through and wade through the waves of trouble, but still survive and keep going. And that's very inspiring. And then as a bonus, there's people out there who um, like have the ability to build like massive tribes and build trust very quickly. And I think that that's another trait. For example, like Carissa, who was on the podcast, and I think Carissa, she was... 
she was episode seven of the podcast she has like a massive following all her people love her they trust her they engage with her and that's that's really impressive as well too so um yeah that would be the bonus characteristic crystal was episode seven carly was episode five my bad and then the characteristic that i deplore the most um (laughs) this is funny i just people who don't keep their commitments I think that really kind of bothers me because I do my best to make sure I keep my commitments. And if I'm going to dedicate some time to you and make time my schedule, it's important to me. And so there are people out there who maybe commit to some things and they flake or they say, oh, I'm too busy. I need to change. And that's fine if you need to change and maybe switch dates. But if you just switch dates and then never follow through and never pick a date, that's kind of the sign of someone who's flaky. And I think that's just a bad characteristics. Like we're all busy now, but if you can keep your commitments, it's really important. It says a lot about your character. So, you know, one person named Debbie Millman, I listened to her podcast called Design Matters. She says busy is a decision. And I love that saying. And so, yeah, if people don't keep their commitments, that's not a characteristic I like. So, you know, deplore is a really strong word. But along those lines, that's that would be a characteristic that I don't really like that much. Thank you very much for the question, Carly. I'll see you soon. What is something that scares you? All right. So got to sit up for this question. Um, (laughs) I think that what scares me personally professionally is just growing old alone now if you didn't know i'm kind of a romantic by heart you don't have to tell anyone you can keep it between you and me keep it on the down low but yeah like growing alone growing old alone just scares me and so i'm plenty young there's lots of time left for sure i have a long life to live but if i'm going to honestly answer that question that would be the number one thing that scares me everything else not so much like i'm just confident my business will be successful and all that but um, growing old alone is what scares me the most. How has a failure or apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favourite failure of yours? In terms of a favourite failure, we're going to go back to Scratch Academy. It's a one-year program. You have to go and pass through six different classes. One of the classes is a scratching class. And then you have like 101, 202, 303. 404 and 505 and each class they teach you skills that build upon the previous class so like in 101 you learn about like beat matching 202 you learn about how to like beat match put together a set 303 you learn about troubleshooting how to get sound up and quickly if there are issues then 404 you go through and you play like a lounge set that you'd play at like a hotel you play your prime time set if you're going on prime time at a club you go prime time with requests and then opening if you're opening up for someone and then your final project is either you have to like dj a wedding or we had a dj like a grammy party and take requests so once you pass that then you get on to 505 and 505 you have to take um let me think here you have like seven different performances you have to do. It totals up to, I wanna say like 400 points. In order to pass the class, you have to get 300 out of, no, you have to get 300, let me think here, 400. Right, so it's a total of 500 points and you have to get 400 out of 500, 80% to pass the class. And so each time you go to class, you have to perform either a lounge set, prime time opening, prime time with requests you get judged by the professors and you get a score and so you go through the first time and it's very very difficult you have to play your sets and say for example you have a prime time set and someone plays in their prime time set someone might play like cardi b i like it like that they might play like bruno mars 24 karat magic and they might play like you know montel jordan this is how you we do it If they play those songs, you can't play them. It's a burn rule. So you have to be very creative with your crates and your sets, and you have to go on, and you have 20 minutes to perform. What's probably the most difficult part is that as someone else is playing, you have to come on after them, keep the sound going, change out your computer, 
and then start your set. And it was extremely nerve wracking. It was crazy. It was difficult. So I go through the whole class, 505, and I get to the final exam, which is you have to arrive at class. Instead of like arriving at class at like 4 p.m., you have to arrive at class at like 9 a.m. And you have to perform in the time slot like it's a club. So if you're there at 9 a.m. and you're performing, it's like it's 9 p.m. at the club. If you if your time slot, you're performing in front of maybe 18 or 19 people and of your peers who are also performing. And if your time slot is like 1130, then you're close to prime time because it's like 1130 p.m. So you go through the entire um, day, entire performance, entire final exam. You have to go and wait while the instructors decide who passes and who doesn't passes because they add up your cumulative score and see who passes. So then they come out and they call me and uh, two other DJs in the room. And they're like, okay, well, Amro, you got a 398 out of 500, so you don't pass. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's like two points away from passing and I can't pass. So like, They're like, no. You're not ready. You have to work on this and work on that. And I'm used to being like like a high achiever. Like, you know, I was a general manager at a young age. I was an all-state, all-county soccer athlete. Like, I'm used to being like the best of the best. And this was like a massive shot to my pride, my ego, because I was out here putting myself out there. And then I failed pretty much. I didn't pass the class. So I had to choose. Do I take my ball and go home or do I swallow my pride and come back again for round two because there's many DJs who don't pass the class and some of them just say, forget it, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. Some others come back, take the class again and still don't pass because there's no guarantee that you're going to pass it the second time. It's all subjective. You could mess up while you DJ this next time. You could not get sound up. That You could just not perform well. So it's very subjective. You have to really be on your stuff a second time. There's no guarantee. What made it worse this time is that after our final exam, we had like this reception where alumni was there and people who were in the certification program were there. And so it was like a mini celebration for the people who passed. But if you didn't pass, you were still there. People knew you took the final exam. They knew you didn't pass. It was extremely embarrassing. It was just bad. And I think at the same time that this happened, like I think there was this girl I was talking to and she was like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. We should just be friends. I don't want to be friends. So you have a, a whammy with your personal life. Then with the DJ life, you don't pass the class either. So I was kind of down in the down in the dumps. It was it was quite humbling. Um, so I decided to not take my ball home. I decided to stay, take the class again. And I go through the whole class and this time, I get one of the highest scores ever in the program. So I was extremely proud. Um, ironically, at the graduation, because you graduate, you get a plaque and everything. At the graduation, the director of the program, Hapa, you know, they all say some words about everyone. And he saved me for last out of all the graduates. And he was just saying how I was like a leader in the class. He said some really nice things. And he's not known to give out like a lot of compliments. He's real tough. So that really was meaningful. And then all the other instructors talked and said some nice things. If I have a clip of the speech, I'll put it up there because I watch it every once in a while just to kind of remind me of how far I've come. And it was this experience, this failure, massive failure pretty much, that really, first of all, keeps me hungry. Second of all, it really taught me that I have to take this, continue to take this very seriously. I have to keep my feet on the ground as one of my instructors, Mr. Chalk, advised us when we first began. And it's just a reminder that, you know, like tomorrow, you, you can be good today and not good tomorrow. So you have to work just as hard each day at each event, at each party, because it's not guaranteed. So although this was a pretty major failure, it served as a huge learning lesson for me and also just a springboard to really continue to keep keep it like take it very seriously, keep improving and keep moving forward. So that would be my example of my favorite failure. How do you handle your critics? In terms of critics, I don't know if I'm to the level just yet where I have a lot of critics. I might have a few. And what I'll do is I might listen real quick to see what they're saying. Some of what they say could have some merit. Most of the time it might not. But I'll listen. I'll see if there's anything I can learn or take from their criticism and use to improve. But very quickly, I'll keep it moving. I'll just let it go, let it wash off my back and keep moving forward. So... I'm not to the level where I have a lot of critics yet. Maybe a few. I might listen. Then I'm just going to keep it moving, keep looking forward. So that's how I handle my critics, my haters. Hey, Imani. Chris Pardall here. When doing your interviews, what was the biggest surprise 
that you ever heard as a response that made one of your interviews go in a whole other direction. Thanks for that question, Chris. Chris was episode 35, and it's ironic that he asked this question. I'll explain in a minute. So I think that what surprised me initially is that I interviewed some people, and some people definitely broke down in tears during the interview. I might have edited out a little bit, but for some it's kind of obvious. That's something that surprised me on a few interviews, and it went, it went a different direction because of that. When I was interviewing Chris, and we talked about Dr. Sybil Johnson and just how that kind of shifted our conversation in terms of when Dr. Johnson talked about taking the right risks, that was like a whoa moment. That was a really big one because I didn't expect it to take that direction. And I think even Chris commented on how you know he didn't know we were going to talk about it. But um, that was one that took a different direction. Side note is I've still been trying to track down Dr. Sybil Johnson, Chris, and I want to share your interview with her. I'm going to find her, too. I'm still looking. So I'll keep you posted on that. Another one that kind of took a different direction is when Jamie and I were talking and she was talking about how she lost like her brother to substance abuse and overdose and lost her dad in the same year. And she went through a really, really dark place. That was one that went a different direction, but I really appreciated her honesty and her transparency because that was very impactful for other people. That was one. Then most recently, I think it was episode 48 with Ashley, and she talked about how her and her dad weren't kind of on speaking terms and just kind of why that happened. That was a little bit of a different direction. But once again, props to Ashley for sharing that with us because other people can relate. And so that was another one that took a different direction. And then the fourth one was when Claire talked about how she was like two days away from leaving her job and she ended up like tearing her meniscus and her leg up so she had to stay and she had to recover that was one i was just like oh my goodness like i didn't expect the story to hit me the way it did but it was really really like just impactful so i would say to answer your question chris those are probably the four times that come to mind in terms of when i was in an interview with someone on the podcast and it kind of went in a different direction but great question all right, that brings us to the end of part one of episode 50. Part two will be out in a few days. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you tune in to part two because it'll be just as good as part one. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions for this episode. And I will see you very soon for part two. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Amani Experience podcast. You can check out the show notes on amaniexperience.com slash podcast. Please remember to leave us a review on the platform you are listening on and share this podcast with anyone who you feel would benefit from listening. See you soon on our next episode.